Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're joining us from. Um, I am excited to see you uh, to join us for our brand new uh, CEU class. Uh, my name is Slavi Younger. I'm with Thrush. I will, uh, let me see my eyeballs going all over the place. I'm checking to see how many people are still trickling in. So I want to give it a little bit of time before we get started. Um, and get going. Um, as we're waiting for folks to join us, if you are uh, new to Frosh, welcome. We are a manufacturer of acoustical products. We are located in Arlington, Texas. We manufacture everything here, and we uh, we make ceiling products, uh, wall products, some dividers, and lighting as well. Uh, so that's kind of the story about us. My name is Slavi Younger. I'm one of the original um, co-founders of the company, uh, and I do love uh, education, I love humans, so I, humans and, and this kind of interaction, so I, I kind of spend a lot of time on this side of the, on this side, you know, in education. Um, anyway, I feel like we have a good number that's in here uh, joining us. Um, if you just popped in, again, welcome, welcome, excited to teach you. I did turn on my camera just so you guys can, can tell there's actually a real human on the other side, but I will turn it off so you don't have to be looking at my big head and you can see the presentation in its full form. Um, the other thing, as far as, um, as, far as just notes, uh, I have Lisa, our marketing manager online as well. Uh, she will be monitoring questions. So please feel free to write in your question into a question section. Uh, the, at the end, I'll try to save some a uh, few minutes for us so we have a time to answer those. I will try to also open your microphones at the end so you can also ask your question that way as well. All right, that's it. Let me turn off my camera so you guys can see the presentation in full and let's get going. All right, so the topic uh, of discussion today will be about improving soundscape in education spaces. This class is approved for, uh, by AIA as well as uh, IDCEC for continuing education. It is rated HSW, so you can get a one hour credit for either of the bodies. Uh, if, you, um, if you're interested in a credit and you did not uh, also register for at AEC daily, I need to know how to do that. Uh, just reach out to us after, we'll be able to help you. So, what that means is we automatically report all your, all your hours and there's nothing else that you will need to do after. So what are we going to be talking about? So first we'll talk about um, the acoustical challenges that we see in learning spaces. We'll talk about the effects um, the challenges have on learning and progress, and then we'll go uh, into solutions, right? How can we uh, mitigate a lot of the issues that we see in education? Okay, so sound, affects our ability to effectively communicate, listen, and learn, right? So a, a large portion of education happens by exchanging information by talking, right? So in order to, um, in order to learn at the best, we have to understand each other very clearly. Of, of course, as we know, sounds and sound disturbances and acoustics is also not very good for our mental health um, as well. Okay, so before we dig in into, um, into uh, school-specific uh, challenges, let's quickly review basics of acoustics. I like to do this on a few slides before we get going, just because it uh, helps us all use the same language and understand what we're talking about. So to start, I'd like you to visualize a sound wave as a as a true wave and how it would interact with surfaces, right? How would a sound wave interact with all the surfaces in, in the space, okay? So that's really what sound wave uh, does. Um, and we use these words to describe different things that the sound waves are doing. So let's get through these uh, uh, here quickly. So reverberation, I'm sure you hear it all the time. So what is reverberation? Reverberation essentially means uh, it's the time after the initial noise or the initial sound is made. Uh, it's the time after that 
uh, the sound lingers, right? So how long the sound lingers in a space that's called reverberation. The most offensive version of reverberation is an echo, right? That's a really long reverberation uh, that you see in really large spaces with a lot of hard surfaces. Okay, let's talk about reflection. So reflection is a process of going, um, going, um, uh, taking the sound wave and and hitting a um, a hard surface, right? So imagine concrete, imagine glass, and imagine this sound wave hitting the hard surface and bouncing back into the space. Absorption is the exact opposite of reflection. Imagine something poofy and porous and the sound wave hitting the poofy and porous surface and getting trapped in all the little nooks and crannies, right? So blocking is different than absorption. A blocking essentially means you actually created a barrier between between uh, two spaces, either, you know, you can think of it as a wall, right? Uh, between street and building or, or, or wall within the building uh, so the sound cannot travel. And decibel, decibel is just a unit of measure we, we use to define how loud a, a sound is. You already see a little note here that any um, sound that is higher than 85 decibels, if you are around that for extended period of time, you can actually damage your hearing. So that's why it's important. Um, I'm gonna show you next a short little video done by a great professor uh, of architectural, architectural uh, acoustics, Michael Ehrman, that explained the, explains this really well. <laughs> When sound impinges on a surface, like that found on a building's interior, some of the energy passes through. Some of the sound energy is absorbed and reassigned as heat within the material. <laughs> you can't make the wall hot by yelling at it. It's not that much heat. There are molecules inside the building material, and when they are impinged upon by the sound energy, they move, and as they rub together, they lose some of the energy through friction. Finally, some of the energy is reflected. All three are happening simultaneously, transmission, absorption, and reflection. We can also model it like this. All materials transmit, orbit, and reflect sound. Not in this universe. It's transmit, absorb, and reflect sound. Yeah, that's what I meant. Um, of course you did. This is a function of the material mass, surface smoothness, fiber orientation, porosity, air tightness, and stiffness. Let's look at a material with little mass and a surface with negligible pores. Say glass. We'll put glass on top. Watch as sound impinges on the glass. Lots of energy transmitted, not much mass to the glass, not much absorbed in the surface of the glass, few pores and therefore few corresponding air pockets. Simultaneously, we'll look at concrete. Smooth concrete, much more mass, and provided the concrete barrier is airtight, absent penetrations, very little will transmit through the barrier. Because the concrete surface is smooth, there is little absorption and high levels of sound reflection. Finally, we'll add a third barrier. We'll start with the concrete wall and add a layer of fabric wrap glass fiber to it. The mass of the concrete restricts the sound energy transmitting through, but the pores in the glass fiber absorb a good deal of the sound so that relatively little is transmitted and relatively little is reflected. And which one is best? Well, it depends. Generally, we have little use for barriers that allow sound to travel into a building or through buildings, so usually less sound transmission is a worthwhile goal. But the proportion of sound that is reflected relative to the proportion that is absorbed, that decision is the subject of the next series of animations. All right, I hope uh, that kind of put it uh, together what we talk about when we talk about these, uh, all these uh, uh, reflection, reverberation, all the kind of things, right? It's all defined by the materials that are in the, in the space and those are the ones that just essentially, accumulation of the materials is what decides what the roomscape is in the room. Um, so the other thing that's important that you hear uh, a lot of is NRC, right? That's thrown around noise reduction coefficient all the time. So what is NRC? So NRC's 
is a um, is a measure that every material comes with, right? And what it essentially tells us is how sound absorptive it is. Uh, we mentioned before that th this word reflection and absorption, right? Reflection is the hard surfaces where sound waves just hit the surface and bounce back into the space. So that would be about zero, right? And perfect absorption would be about one. Um, you can think of, uh, so that again, something hits the, hits the space and get one. So the rate, the, the products range in between zero and one. Uh, again, quick little video that explains the NRC really well from our friends. <coughs> But there's a way to quantify how much sound is reflected into the room. Yes, we use a metric called the absorption coefficient and denoted with the Greek lowercase letter alpha. The absorption coefficient is one of those measurements that ranges between zero and one. One means that no sound energy is reflected. Everything is either absorbed or transmitted. An open exterior window has an absorption coefficient and alpha of one because none of that sound that impinges on the open window plane returns to the room. Then a zero means 100% of the sound is reflected. What is an example of building material with an absorption coefficient of zero? Reaching a point where absolutely nothing is either absorbed or transmitted is impossible, but we come close with our smooth concrete example here. The absorption coefficient of smooth concrete is 0.02. 2% of the sound energy is transmitted or absorbed, so 98% of the sound energy is reflected. <laughs> That's a lot. Yep. And when we apply our fabric wrapped glass fiber and we mount it on the furring with an airspace behind it, the absorption coefficient is about, well, you guess. Um, 0 0.95? That's about right, though that would be on the high end of the range. So only 5% of the sound energy is reflected. An effective absorber will have a sound absorption coefficient greater than 0 0.75. So more than three-fourths of the arriving sound is absorbed or transmitted, taken out of the room. An effective reflector will generally have a sound absorption coefficient of less than 0 0.20. So at least 80% of the arriving sound is reflected. Remember that the proportion that is transmitted, reflected, and absorbed varies across the frequency spectrum. So the numbers we've been using here are shortcuts. In reality, a material will have a different sound absorption coefficient value at each octave band. But there is a single number available, something that describes the performance across the spectrum. There's almost always a single number available to summarize performance across frequencies. In this case, it's called the Noise Reduction Coefficient, or NRC. It is calculated by simply taking the average absorption coefficient across four mid-frequency octave bands. And, as with almost all the single number metrics, it fails to be useful and can be downright misleading. In the presence of the low frequency noises associated with mechanical noise, electric amplification, and even unamplified music performance, many materials, sound reflective in the middle frequencies, absorb sound in the low frequencies. So when do we use more sound absorbing material? We add sound absorbing material if we have excessive reverberance, especially for speech intelligibility reasons. An architecture student designed this cafeteria without acoustic consideration and simulated the aural environment, which sounds something like this. In language, infinity networks with a small set And with the addition of sound absorption, as well as some acoustically irrelevant daylighting changes, make it sound like this. In language, infinitely many words can be written with a small set of letters. That's a really big difference, both visually and orally. In practice, adding more sound absorbing material to a room with some already existing quantity of sound absorbing material affects the room only modestly. But Adding even a little sound absorbing material to a room with almost no existing absorption leverages substantial changes to the acoustic character of the space. We also use sound absorption to nullify an acoustic defect, like the echo that smacks off the real wall of a long room. Coating the offending surface with fuzz fixes the offending reflection because so little sound is reflected. More on that later.
Okay, I hope you enjoy these as much as I as I as I do. I feel like the 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 way they are done is is uh, is specific enough, but not too dense that it's hard for us laymen's to really understand it. So I hope you guys enjoyed what that is. So let's take what we've learned about the acoustics and let's start talking about classroom acoustics and apply what the all the terms we've just uh, heard and used into. Uh, this kind of space. Okay, so in the United States, the the average classroom is about 960 square feet and about 12 feet with 12 foot high ceilings. Um, the target reverberation for classroom is 0.4 to 0.6 seconds when unoccupied, right? So what does that mean? We want the reverberation uh, tail or like how long the sound lasts in a space to not exceed 0.6 seconds, right? Well, uh, the the calculations of uh, for this room, uh, if there are no sound absorptive materials added, comes to approximately to 1.9 seconds. That is uh, three times higher than recommended, right? So it probably would sound maybe not quite as bad as that uh, cafeteria in the video before, but certainly not uh, not the way you would want it to sound. Uh, uh, as far as classroom. So now let's talk about what causes it, right? So majority of classrooms are um, are built out of a lot of hard surfaces, right? We have windows, blackboards, concrete, gypsum, and all of these fall under the sound reflecting materials. So what happens is, and I, I hope um, you guys are okay with this, this, uh, this illustration we have here, uh, that shows you the experience and sort of how the reverberation works, right? So you, you have the direct sound, right? That's the teacher talking. That's the first thing that happens and that's the first thing that reaches your ear. Uh, then happen, what happens next is early reflection. So that's sort of something, that this is the louder noise that hits uh, your ear just milliseconds after. And then depending on how many hard surfaces are in the room, uh, that the sound waves can reflect off of, you'll keep getting additional uh, additional uh, um, uh, hits to your to your ear with the same sound, right? So what happens is your brain ends up having difficulty telling the difference between the direct sound and all the other noise, right? And that's kind of what we call a um, that's kind of what we call a, uh, a smearing, like sound smearing, which means you know the lack of lack of understanding. Uh, of, of course, the uh, younger the kids uh, and uh, kids with learning uh, disabilities really uh, have a hard time with, with this. Uh, and, and, and kids that actually have uh, hearing aids, you know, hearing aids are actually worse at differentiating between the sounds. So if there's a reverberative space, uh, the hearing aid almost can become completely useless because what's being said is not understood. Okay, so we mentioned that the classroom, average classroom with no treatment would be about 1.9 uh, reverberation. So here, let's take a look at this reverberation uh, chart um, to look at, look at the place where that, where that takes us, right? So 1.9, if you look at the bottom, you know, unless you are make, uh, building a multi-purpose auditorium or a church, you are way, 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 way up there, right? That's not where you want to be. Uh, what classrooms are, and really pretty much almost all spaces in education, are spaces where we're exchanging information. So what does that mean? It means we need the clarity of sound and the clarity of humans, I mean, clarity of speech. So, and the clarity of the human speech happens with a very low reverberation, right? So that's kind of where we need to be. Um, so how do we estimate reverberation? You know, oftentimes it's super obvious when you walk in, you know, so if, uh, the first option is you hire an acoustician, right? They can come in and do all the measurements. As you probably guys know, um, that is a pretty expensive option. The other option is, um, you know, uh, standing in the middle of the, in a little mid middle of the room. And if you on your own just clap and you can count to one or two seconds, you, um, certainly will know that that space can benefit from acoustical treatment. Um, there's also a, a, a very um, a trustworthy Sabin 
uh, formula where you can plug in all your numbers and get a really good approximate uh, uh, numbers as to what, what you want to do. The rule of thumb here is, you know, if you cover about 15 to 25% of the hard surfaces in a space, you will get a favorable outcome. Okay, so besides reverberation, meaning all the sounds that are being made in the room that are reflecting off of hard surfaces, they also have environmental noises. What does that mean? Right. So we also, I mean, if you remember being a kid and the classroom that gets to go on recess before you were just outside, how distracting just that can be. Um, uh, imagine if you have a lot of uh, sounds coming at you, right? The HVAC noise, outside noise, uh, uh, transmission of noise from other rooms. So this cumulative noise is what's called environmental noise. Um, when you have environmental noise, in order to hear the speaker, what this is called signal to noise ratio, right? So signal would be the teacher talking and the noise would be the background noise, right? So what happens is the, the speaker has to talk above the noise for us to understand them. Uh, kind of a, a fun example would be, imagine that you're in a kitchen with your friend that happened to have a really loud refrigerator. Let's say it's a hundred decibel, right? Something really, really high. And let's say you are talking at 50 decibels. Well, or let's say start at 35, right? You're talking at 35 decibels, um, but that you guys cannot hear each other. Even if you raise your voice to 65 decibels, you're still going to struggle with understanding, right? Because you need to be at least 15 decibels over the background noise before you can understand, right? So that's kind of where we talk about intelligibility, like speech is heard clearly enough. Um, so you can differentiate uh, every word, every syllable, and it's clearly understood. So what does that mean? Well, as 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 you guys know, is the, you know probably know that uh, the proximity to a teacher uh, definitely uh, has increased on engagement uh, from a student, right? It also does mean that they actually can understand clear, right? Um, but most of the classrooms are not designed to address that, right? Uh, within a classroom of 30, 30 kids, uh, a child could be as far as 27 feet away from the teacher, right? So that's one problem. The other one is if you have, if we do have acoustical issues in, in this place, so much of gets lost. I mean, so much as every fourth word, a word can be can be missing. Um, this matters much more the younger the kids are. And why is that? Uh, as you can imagine, their vocabulary, their, their reading capabilities are not all the equal to, to adults, right? So when you and I are in a space like that, we can do a better job at filling the missing, missing gaps. However, kids, uh, they really have to uh, devote all their cognitive abilities to understanding what's being said, right? They're learning new concepts, they're hearing lots of words for the first time ever. So the fact that there's stuff missing in the middle makes it very challenging. And also what ends up happening, it's called listening fatigue, which sometimes it is misunderstood as, oh, they just are lazy or they're uninterested, but they really just run out of uh, steam, right? Like they, it is just so, it requires so much uh, uh, bandwidth uh, to focus that at some point you just have to uh, disengage. All right, so if, you know, so why is that, as we already said, Fill in the blanks is really, really tricky uh, for someone that is not as uh, as mature. So let's do a little test. Um, I let's test it on ourselves, right? So I have this um, text here, and I am going to open a poll question that I would love for you guys to answer, which is, which the um, hmm, let's, and there it is. Okay, launch. So the question is, can you understand this text? Were you able to understand and read this paragraph? So I'll just go down. Thank you guys. Read it and punch in your numbers. Okay, so about 50% of you already answered, which is which is quite good. And 
look, look at you guys. So you, uh, 82 of you said totally, and 12% said uh, that you get the gist, right? Um, there you go. So not surprising. I suspect that there's probably no six, seven, and eight-year-olds in this class, and that's why our rates are as they are, right? So what what uh, did, it, did it say the actual answer would say, according to research at Cambridge University, it doesn't matter at what order the letters are, we can understand them. Uh, this is an example of something that would be really hard for a for a fifth, six, seven year old to figure out, right? For us, we can certainly do it. And it has all to do with repetition and life experience. Um, and anyway, I guess the main point I forgot to say, this is kind of actually what happens when the sound uh, reverberation and soundscapes is not appropriate uh, for the space. They are really essentially, you essentially giving a muddled version of, of that. So let's take, take a couple look at the effects, right? So if you're saying it does this, does that, does it actually affect kids' performance? Do they actually do worse if the conditions are not uh, as they're supposed to be? Um, I like this this one um, one researcher. Yeah, there's so many, but I've I picked a couple for you guys to um, uh, to share with you. So back in '75, uh, a uh, a, um, uh, a a a um, New York University professor ran into a ran into a mom and said that my kids are, they're right, their classroom is right next to this elevated train and it's so hard to understand and, um, and uh, you know, they're having difficulty, uh, difficulty in school. So what they did actually is they went into class and did some research and their analysis actually showed that the difference between kids on the quiet side of the school versus the loud side of the school was such that a full, that, that by sixth grade, kids were, uh, full year behind in reading, right? So very stuff, substantial difference. Um, you know, oftentimes you see this research and you never kind of see, it's like, hey, did they correct it? What was the difference? But in this instance, um, this is partly why I like it, is they actually got rid of local transit authority. They, they did some procedures on the tracks. They actually implemented a lot of acoustical absorb, uh, absorbers, like ceiling tiles and some wall absorbers. And uh, when they came in and uh, ran uh, the the comparisons after that um, the kids actually uh, the implement uh, the kids actually caught up they caught up to uh, to their um, to their um, partners on the other side and you couldn't really measure the difference between the so two sides of the of the space here's another one this is actually an air, just a natural experiment that happened and it was because um, Munich uh, was closing an old airport and opening a new airport and there was this natural time where you, they, that these researchers could actually see how much is it affecting uh, kids um, when there's a, you know, a noise like that outside on different things, right? They check long-term memory, running memory, and a few other things. So if you guys look, um, the no aircraft noise, it's the orange color. That means kids that do not, they're too far from being affected by, uh, by the aircraft noise. And the blue is the kids that were close enough to be affected by aircraft noise. And you can see what a difference it makes in their long-term memory, as well as their running memory, right? Uh, the interesting thing is uh, that they speak in this in, in this paper was that after the airport is closed, that they actually caught up, a lot of kids actually caught up uh, to it. And of course, they drop again after new airport was open. However, you know, they were, they were, um, they were looking into like how, you know, how, if this is persistent problem, at what point you no longer can catch up, right? So it's it's definitely, um, it's definitely something that accumulates. Uh, the, and the conclusion was that cognitive tasks requiring central language processing, processing are very sensitive to noise. All right, so that's enough of the studies. Uh, let's kind of look at the other side of things. Let's talk a little bit about teachers. And actually this is sort of teachers and as well as, as the kids, but, um, so what have we seen with kids, uh, I mean, with teachers and um, very echoey uh, spaces? It increases stress level. It increases blood pressure. Um, teachers are one of the few, it's, it's actually said that only 5% of general population say that they have vocal fatigue, but 80 teachers experience this, right? Occupational voice disorders uh, is a very common problem. There's also hearing loss problems, which we'll go uh, into that a little more in depth in a little bit. 
And um, obviously, if you are in an environment where you're constantly straining your voice, where you uh, are increasing your stress and anxiety because of because you're constantly having to raise your voice over the the reverb and the and the noise pollution, which then also means the kids also mimic that and they raise your voice. It creates a very stressful environment, and what it does, of course, causes absenteeism as well, which is not good for the teachers nor for the kids' education. Um, so let's look a little bit of the the, the, um, the hearing loss and gym. So. You know, a lot of the open spaces in, in the schools are some of the biggest uh, problems, right? The biggest culprit of, of, of noise. Uh, again, because it's a really big space, oftentimes it doesn't have adequate acoustical treatment. Um, in one research or one, one study they were, that these uh, guys did is they had a, a students wear um, you know, measuring device uh, to just see what kind of uh, what kind of decibels they were exposed to throughout the day. Well, uh, while in the while in a gym environment, it would range between 90 and 106 decibels. Um, that is equivalent to uh, like um, uh, that's like an industrial level noise, right? That's that is a noise that um, uh, uh, that if you worked in a, if if you were the persistent noise, you would be actually requiring to wear earplugs, right? Ear protection. Um, the way it's usually measured is what is the load, right? Like how many hours can you be in that noise before we need to be concerned about, about uh, hearing loss? Um, well, in this kind of noise, uh, the maximum is two hours, right? So, if you so that essentially would mean uh, a teacher can only teach for two hours before they, they, have, in uh, they have potentially impeding on their on their um, hearing. Um, similar things you see in other spaces, uh, all the ones I mentioned in here, there's plenty of other places where they did uh, during, uh, you can easily get to 100 decibels in, in, the, in the cafeterias, in the hallways and things like that. Um, you know, uh, I put a comment here that OSHA does requires employers to provide uh, hearing aids if, you're, if the average is 85 or higher and it's the eight eight hour working time. So obviously they're not in this kind of noise all the time. So that's not what we're trying to say. What I'm trying to say that they have enough exposure to this kind of noise that for sure at least stress and anxiety uh, producing condition are certainly present. Um, you know, <laughs> this is just a, that was just a random noise of a cafeteria. Would you like to have your meal every day? in that noise, I didn't play very long because actually does get really annoying. Anyway, so let's get to the fun part. Let's talk about solutions. Um, so first, I like to uh, touch on the material uh, that we will be talking about. So all the solutions that I will be showing you are made out of a product called PET Felt. The reason I'm focusing on that is because this, this is the one I know because this is the one a Frage works with. Um, so let's talk about the benefits of felt and how within a school environment. First, we have to talk about durability and performance. PET looks like felt. I'm sure you, most of you have seen it before. You might probably have worked with it before. It's, it has a fantastic story, right? It's made out of recycled plastic bottles. Um, you know, it, it feels like wool, but it is, um, but it is not a, organic material, therefore it doesn't, um, it doesn't fall apart, right? It doesn't, uh, it holds up really well. Uh, the other thing is it can be formed, can be shaped, it can be printed on, which allows you to do a lot of interesting things that hopefully are fit within the idea of let's, you know, let's enhance the design of the space uh, and also bring the sound absorption that we need or sound, a sound absorption that we need so the space can be, um, can be um, well received. So, uh, oh, and also, you know, we've been throwing around the NRC here and NRC there. Well, the PET felt uh, has the NRC rating of 0.75. And that is just the raw material. A lot of, of the products I will be showing you is actually much closer to one, right? That then it has to do with, with how you fold it, how you treat it, and what you do with it to increase the reverberation as well. So cleanability, a uh, couple of things. It's uh, again very uh, robust, easy to maintain. You can do not just basic cleaning. You can dust it. You can um, 
you can uh, spot treat it, and you can clean it to CDC uh, uh, to CDC recommended guidelines to ki to kill and prevent viruses. Right? You can actually clean it with a mixture of uh, bleach, um, bleach and water, or any of the uh, cleaning like Lysol things as, as you see in the market. The only difference between cleaning hard surfaces versus um, versus um, with something like PET is this you you spray this and you and you walk away right you um, you don't um, you don't have to treat it past um, you don't have to wipe it right you don't have to do any of that after that. All right so the last part about PET I have for you is sustainability. Um, if you if you are looking for a product that's low VOC, if you're looking for a product that will that uh, helps you with lead certification, you can do that. This is 100% recyclable, and we also do have uh, declare label, red list free label, or whatever your product requires. Uh, most of these actually. Uh, fit within that. The other thing I forgot to mention, it's also uh, it's class A fire rated and um, product as well. And since we're talking about schools, right, uh, color and aesthetics, you know, we have, uh, this is a great way to sort of combine the, um, the, the technical sound absorptive feature with, uh, with the look of of, um, of what you know, what you're trying to create. Um, so we kind of touched on the the average classroom before. So I wanted to wrap this up uh, here, right? So we know the size of the class, average classroom. We mentioned that 15 to 25 percent of coverage would um, uh, would uh, would give you the you know would bring the the reverberation to where it needs to be. So here I just picked a random product. Here I picked Brick 2.0, which I'll show you what it looks like. And, and it shows you like how much do you need to cover? What does it do for your acoustics? And there's a, a estimated product cost. These are actually in list prices. If you know what that means, I'm just going to leave it at that. So anyway, the investment is not huge. The process isn't that difficult to really make impactful difference. And I don't. I hope you guys caught it in a video where it said that the first treatment makes the biggest difference, right? So if you have rooms where there is no uh, no acoustical products in, right? They're, everything's hard surfaces. Even getting in a little bit will make a huge difference. You know, the, the perception of the change will be pretty dramatic. Um, so the rules of thumb when we are putting things in schools, obviously you you have the walls you can, you can use. Anytime you can create or use a product that comes with air cavity, uh, that's preferred because products do perform better if there's an air cavity available. Um, it, oftentimes in schools, you know, uh, walls might not be available, so play, so treating ceiling is a great option. As a matter of fact, ceiling, anything, anytime you suspend something, you're essentially you're also allowing the product to work um, uh, all around, right? So all sides of the product uh, perform for you, therefore you actually get a better, a uh, better performance. So now. This is the fun part. I uh, and this is super uh, visual heavy because I know you guys love this. So I'm gonna just show you. We kind of talked about everything and anything. So I'm gonna just show you a bunch of photos of different applications to get your uh, creative juices flowing. You know, sky's the limit. The whole point is how do you change the ratio in a space between the hard surfaces and soft surfaces so you get the proper acoustics right so once you figure that out how you're going to skin this cat meaning how you get that material in is really um there's million options right so let's look at walls so there's some products i'm showing you uh by the names that are under there there's you know clouds there's brick 2.0 uh hex pillow and pyra they're fantastic they actually have a really high especially like pyra and pillow i think it's like 0.95 NRC. The reason is because all of these are have hollow cavities, right? They're three-dimensional, they're hollow cavities, and also because they're folded, there's all that additional material that you fit into a smaller surface area, which really helps with the NRC. Uh, the other option is direct glue. There's, there's a bunch of shapes, you know, really can, can do all kinds of different things when it comes to that. Anytime you, one thing to remember, anytime you direct glue any acoustical material directly to hard substrate, the port, you, you're not maximizing the performance. You need the air cavity for it to be maximized. Not to say that this doesn't work, it does, except the NRC does go down. 
these are our latest guys. These are actually been nominated for a HIP award. We'll find out uh, on uh, Sunday during Neocon if they also have won. So uh, cross your fingers for us. But what I love about these guys is, again, 0.95 NRC. Um, what you see, the blue and the yellow is the same shape. It just they're just arranged differently. Uh, it's extremely easy installation, really. When we work with schools, that's what we care about. You know, save money on installation. Can it be moved? Yes, yes. All this can be moved. It comes. It, it puts on it with impaler because it's you know sort of it gets, sticks out and has a uh, built-in cavity. It gives you that exceptional performance. There's a few other products. Again, built-in air cavity is what you want. Again, really highly rated. You got plank and two different looks of Lenny felt. All right, so let's touch on, um, so this guy, so I have one more here, which is kind of a mixture between ceiling and divider right here. So brick 2.0 on the wall, and then some dividers uh, uh, to create additional space. You know, um, I'm gonna touch on dividers here in a little bit, so let me, let me save my thoughts. So let's kind of look up, right? Let's take a look at what we can do with the ceiling. Um, here, round clouds, right? Kind of a, what you'll see, and this is a traditional standard way to name things, anything hanging, horizontal we call cloud anything hanging vertical is called baffle what you see here is actually also there's also acoustical treatment on the walls this is the same way as the other uh hanging pieces are built these also are always hollow that's kind of what you want to see when you select products is how is it built right you want the the, the air cavity uh as much as you can to do that. Here's another options, right? Ripple, sunburst, nest, they're kind of similar. They kind of create a movement, right? They're sort of a great well to also define space. Um, and these also do perform really well. I mean, we didn't go that, uh, as in depth into, into diffusion, things like that in this class, but, but because there's all that variation that's really good for sound, uh, sound absorption. Again, Waffle Baffle, one of the uh, super popular ones. Um, Harmony, same thing. You can get that uh, with light or without. Hex Cloud in the center. Uh, again, just, you know, like I said, you can you can get, you just need to get the material in, right? And what form, uh, you certainly can have some fun with that. Lenny Feld, I showed you earlier before, it's the ceiling as well as wall product, and you can certainly do a combination of the two. Um, let's see. Yes, yeah, so this is just like a ripple and net, just a couple of different looks. And this is a vibe um, that I showed you earlier on the walls. We also provide, we actually have vibe uh, for the ceiling. And actually, these are so amazing because they actually work with traditional drop grid, right? T grid. Uh, they these things are snap in and they completely transform really boring um, T-grid ceiling to something very different uh, and very cool, right? So these are some of the examples of that. Uh, Ripple, this is actually one of the, the one of the most popular ones we've done. We've done this actually in so many school districts. Um, uh, it's very simple to hang, you know, they kind of come together in these small, smaller sections and fantastic for hallway uh, application, things like that. And you, know, you can really even use it uh, to define spaces by colors and things like that, just based on what you choose to do with that. You know, this is this is another thing. I've shown you sunburst done in a different colors, and you see how different it looks. Skinny baffle um, is just one of our baffles here. This one was uh, is wavy and actually was customized with some perforation. Again, skinny baffle can also be really pretty basic, like you see here on the left. Uh, cloud, a hanging cloud right here. Um, and the last section I want to touch on is division, right? So you can certainly bring sound absorption by using your, your hard surfaces, which is your ceilings and your wall. However, whatever, however you bring you know, the, the sound absorptive material into a space, you will also absorb it, right? So, so if you need some sort of a division of a space, if you choose hard surface, you just introduce another sound reflective material. So what we like to recommend, if it's something where we are like trying to create collaborative spaces and open spaces, which is quite tricky, right? When there's so much reverb and you want people to feel like, oh yeah, I can really come here and exchange some ideas. Um, you you know, using, using um, um, dividers made out of PET felt is a fantastic option. 
This is our a part of our softwall series. Um, actually, no, this is a part of our Linifold series. Sorry, this I totally did this wrong. It's part of our Linifold that I showed you on the wall. So this is a version of a round divider Linifold. Here's some of our hanging panels, right? So if you are interested in do, still having some perforation, uh, so you have the natural light going through, but you are needing to add some space, you can certainly do that. So what this does is it creates a visual privacy as well as a sound absorption. One of the things we don't, don't really get to touch on here as much is that also if you put sound absorptive material close to the source, meaning close to the speaking people, it, it absorbs the sound before it has a chance to bounce all over the space, right? So that's actually doing something around um, where, people, where people meet up is a fantastic way. You know, it, it really uh, performs really well. Um, again, more dividers in all kinds of different interesting ways to, to uh, um, as far as application goes, you know, you can do some perforation, you can certainly make them freestanding, you can hang them, you can do, uh, you, so this is part of our softball series, you can do all kinds of different things, right? So it's a really creative way to add, I need door, I need visual uh, privacy, but I also need to add some acoustics. So this is ob obviously all the different ways um, you can address that. Um, the very last thing I wanted to touch on, this is just our my closer, is besides the 36 colors, that um, that are available of PET felt, you can also print on this material, right? So when we start talking about printing, sky's the limit, you can really print anything you like. It does not change the acoustical performance of the product. Here you can see it as a, the, the hanging panel print. Um, but what we also love to do is taking what would be what you've seen before, which I was saying, like it's the products with a built-in cavity, like our brick 2.0, uh, what makes Brick 2.0 so special is that the edges are folded, right? So it's hollow on the inside. So if you look at the photo on the bottom left, it's if you were to take a brick and, uh, pr you know, well, the process actually is you first print on it, then you fold the, fold the edges and you, uh, and uh, so essentially you have a brick that's been printed on. What it ends up looking like, it literally just looks like, um, it looks like canvas, right? You could also put it in a frame, but it's a good way to combine two things. You need some artwork on the walls, um, or maybe just the art art budget is what's left, and you could use some acoustics. It's a fantastic way uh, to approach that. All right, so that is the um, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I'm impressed with it myself. I did it looks like in 50 minutes, which I can be. If you know me, you know I can be a little long-winded. So <laughs> this is a good this is good thing for me. I very much, um, you know, this was my first time, so probably not as polished as some of my other classes. So I, I appreciate you guys bearing with me. Um, you know, I would love to absolutely hear what you loved, what you were like eh about, what you wish we could expand on, because this, you know, we can make it whatever we need to make it, so it serves you the best it it can. Um, I, we have a few minutes for questions. So I am going to, and it doesn't always work for everyone, but I will I will click this thing that says uh, attendees can unmute themselves. You still need to unmute yourself in order to ask a question, but you now have the ability. Uh, so you please feel free to ask anything that uh, that you'd like to know, and I'll be happy to answer. Okay, and uh, Lisa, did we get any question, written questions that we need to address, or? No, I don't see that any have come in yet. Oh, okay, okay, perfect. All right, so you guys are a quiet bunch. Uh, all right, no worries, no problem. So let me just let me just finish with. Again, thank you so much. Like I said, we are a uh, uh, we do help. It, acoustics can be a bit of a black magic, right? Can be confusing. We help folks with figuring out how much they need all the time. We have estimators. That's that. That's what they do. They will they will help you. They will walk you through it, right? Uh, they will help you. Okay, here's how much you need. And uh, in your case, maybe ceiling is a better option. Than walls and and 
vice versa. Um, so please reach out to us. We'll be happy to answer. Also, if you need samples, uh, you can email the samples at, at frosh.co. And you can reach me at sy at frosh.co. My name is Slavi. I thank you so much uh, for your time. And we'll talk soon. And I feel like as I wrapped up, there's questions. Uh, I am trying to see if I can answer them. Um, thank you. There's compliments. Compliments. Um, more compliments. Thank you so much. Oh, one question. Uh, where are the PT panels manufacturers? Okay. Uh, so pretty much all the PET, uh, 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 all PET manufacturing, with a couple exceptions, there's uh, is done in in China. So these do come from China. Uh, they uh, majority of panels are done there. There's a couple uh, factories in Australia and uh, some in Europe. Majority of PET that is done in the United States uh, caters to uh, automobile industry, it's a different kind of thing. So it's like really much more compact. Um, so that's where the raw material comes from. After that, um, all the manufacturing, all the product part happens in Arlington, Texas. All right. Again, second time saying, um, saying goodbye. Have a fantastic rest of the day and I really appreciate your time. Have a good one.